We have a loaded pod on tap today from Radio Road. Judy Batista from NFL Network is going to join us. Tom Rinaldi from Fox Sports. But we're going to start with you, Ian Rappaport from NFL Network. Rap, what's up, man? How what's going doing? on? I'm doing? great. I'm great. I'm loving it. What do you? Th- you're a New York guy. What do you think about the Jets this off season? Um, it's going to be really fascinating. I mean, so many interesting different things. First of all, um, I like the hire of Nathaniel Hackett. And, you know, it's the one thing to me that people don't understand and maybe will never understand because I seem to go through it all the time is being a head coach and being an offensive coordinator are different jobs. Being a great OC or a great play caller has literally no bearing on whether or not you can be a good, good head coach. Nathaniel Hackett was not a good head coach. He also had terrible play from his quarterback, but he was not a good head coach. That is what it is. He has been in his career a very good coordinator. Like, there's a reason that he was in that position. To me, you look around the league and you try to figure out, like, who are these slam dunk chemist coordinators? And I don't know who they are, but the Jets got a really experienced good one in Hackett. And I know everybody talks about Aaron Rodgers and whatever, but, right. like, that's not why they hired him. They hired him because he's very good, and I think that'll be really big. And then it's like, you know, who's going to be their quarterback? Obviously, a big question as well. How important was that for Robert Sala to get somebody who'd actually call plays in the National Football League prior to coming here? Yeah, I thought it was really good. And you know, again, like you look around and like who else is better? You know, I mean, it was the whole situation was interesting. Like, you know, the Jets basically said like. Oh, you know, we allowed allowed Michael Ford to seek other opportunities, and I'm sure everybody rolled their eyes, but he got a great one. Mm-hmm. Like that was a good move for, you know, I think someone who uh, probably deserved it. And then they fill his post with Hackett, who, you know, it sort of depends on where it looks, but you know, definitely one of the more coveted coordinators out there. I was surprised he That's took this job. That's what I was just going to ask you, considering he could have. Sat by the water I mean, he's do- for a little while. He's doing it for free. Yeah, he's coaching for free um, because he was going to make the money anyway. But he wanted, you know, he that's who he is. He wanted to be in. Um, he wanted to be back coaching, and he just needed a good situation. And you know, I think this is going to be a good situation. Obviously, which quarterback they choose is going to be somewhat telling. Uh, but I do think it's a good situation. What do you think weighed more into that equation for him? The connection with Salah. Or maybe some of the pieces the Jets already have in place, and a Brees Hall, a Garrett Wilson, an Elijah Vera Tucker, a very good defense, knowing that if he comes in and he's paired with a new quarterback, we got a chance to win right away here. Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, the Jets are, are similar to maybe the Panthers. There's not a lot of the teams that are like this where, like, they are good all around. So all you need to do is just drop in a quarterback, whoever it is. So whether it's... You know, Aaron Rodgers or Derek Carr or Baker Mayfield or Ryan Tannehill, if he gets cut or traded, they're going to get someone in there who is going to help make this thing better and elevate it just a little bit. I really like the pieces that the Jets have. Like, the last two drafts have been really, really, really high quality. Obviously, still questions about Zach, but all the other pieces, really high quality. What do you think is going to be the first quarterback ultimately to fall as we watch the dominoes Derek Carr yeah yeah I think we'll know you know pretty soon I mean does does a trade happen anywhere does it happen to the Saints does it happen somewhere else um does he get cut and if he gets cut you know I would expect him to sign relatively quickly before free agency because that's sort of his advantage right and then you know it's him and then maybe we figure out where Aaron Rodgers is going um you know I think that's something to find out as well, and then everything else will fall into place after that. Um, but those are two really, really big dominoes. You're feeling right now, do you think he's playing this year, Rodgers? Rodgers? Yeah. I know it seems like it's hard to get a read. Yeah, I mean, my guess is yes. Yeah. I don't truly know. Um, I don't know it's going to come out of the dark room meditation. <laughs> um, and I don't even joke about that. Like, I think it's I generally don't care what these guys do on their own time, but, like, if that's what he needs to do for right. his, like, personal health, like, he should definitely do it. Right. I think it's not something I would want to do, but do it. Like, you know, like, all the things. Whatever it takes to get you back to, like, being in a good place mentally, do that. We'll see what comes out of that, if he plays or not. My guess is yes, because $60 million, right? Yeah. Um, but whether he'll want to be with the Packers or not, I truly do not know. 
if indeed Jimmy Garoppolo hits the market himself. Which he's going to. Oh, okay. So what do you think is going to be out there as far as teams pursuing him? Um, this team would be one, potentially. Yep. You know, we'll see if they end up with someone else first. Um, but this would be one. You know, I think he's a really good option. You know, he is not that old. He is a good person. He has dealt with a lot, a lot. So, like, the Jets' media market is not for everyone. I don't think Jimmy Garoppolo would care. I think he would be fine, right? Um, and not going to be crazy costs, you know? Um, so, to me, um, I would say that would, like, for the Jets, that would make sense. Panthers, maybe the Titans, um, Bucks, maybe. Yeah. He seems you know? like he had a tremendous reputation. Uh, oh, he's a great guy. Yeah. Oh, he's great. Well yeah. liked inside the locker room. Oh, Everybody yeah. in the organization swears by him. Yeah. I mean, if he ended up as as the Jets quarterback, I think fans would be pretty happy. Like, and, you know, his level of play is what it is. He's never going to be Patrick Mahomes, but like, been to Super Bowls. You know, yeah. like was leading this team to one before he got injured. Like. Definitely good enough. If the Jets get one of those top-tier guys as far as the people are going to be out there, do you see this team being a playoff squad in 2023? Should be. Yeah. Has the talent to. Right. You know, now this was a hard year, but you, so much revolved around the quarterback. I mean, every every Wednesday was a who, who's going to be the Jets starting quarterback. Like, that's not, obviously, that's not a way to win. And that changes everything. I mean, it, it alters the way players react. It alters, I mean, it's just, it's everything. So if you get consistent, good quarterback play, this should be a team that should make a pretty significant leap. What do you think about, uh, we're taping this here on a Wednesday of Super Bowl week, but Thursday night for the Jets at NFL Honors, potentially Sauce Gardner, defensive rookie of the year, Garrett Wilson, offensive rookie of the year. Uh, uh, could we'll, sweep it. Let's start there before which is I crazy ask because, the Hall of Fame. Which is crazy because they actually could have had a different rookie win that same award. I mean, think about that draft class. Like, I don't know what Brees Hall is going to become, and you hope that he's doing well and coming back from his knee injury as he should, but, like, legit potential rock star. Like, truly excellent player. And he, my guess is he would have been the offensive rookie of the year had he not got injured. But anyway, go ahead. He was averaging 6.8 yards a touch when I mean, he went out week seven. And that seems low considering how ridiculous he looked, you know? Speaking of rock stars, Sauce Gardner. He's got the it good one. factor, doesn't it? Yeah. What's so interesting about him, like, the name is great, and his personality seems to be, like, fun, good. He is, like, as solid and basic a player as you could. I'm not going to say he's Darrell Rivas because nobody is Darrell Rivas, but does kind of remind me of him in that, like, matter-of-fact way that he handles his business on the field, like, he is solid, man. Like, he is – that is going to end up being an excellent pick. And what's so interesting, too, is, like, we talk about projecting guys in the draft process, and we're about to get into this now. In college, he allowed almost no receptions, or maybe no receptions. No and touchdowns. No touchdowns. Yeah. And then it was like, well, how's it going to translate? And then he got to the NFL, and it's been exactly the same. Same exact level of play. Quality of play has been better. He's been exactly the same. It's just really good. Did you like the way Salah handled himself throughout last year despite all the adversity, especially inside the room with the guys? Yeah, it's really hard. I mean, it's really hard. Now, he was, you know, he was very positive. Um, and I think one thing that he kind of understands about this is you are not just head coach, you are also lead spokesman. Yeah. And so there's plenty of times where, you know, yes, he's talking to media, but really he's talking to his players through the medium of TV or whatever, right? So, like, NFL Network, ESPN is playing in the facility. Everyone gets the videos on their phones. Players see the press conference. He did a good job of setting the tone, be like, who's ever out here, we are going to play with this guy, which, whichever quarterback it is. And that was – he never, he never let the constant quarterback movement kind of change who he is or what he projected, and I thought that was really important. Uh, you live in New York. You have people in the neighborhood. You got family members uh, who are going to be asking you about the Jets. Where do you think? Every single day. But uh, so as we enter this off season, in the next couple months, uh, where do you think the Jets are going to be in terms of NFL talk? Because with the quarterback situation and them being out there, I mean, one of the more important teams this off season, right? I mean, there's nothing more important than the quarterback. The Jets are have said. We're going to go get a veteran quarterback, so we know they're going to get someone. I mean, they're going to be one of the most talked-about teams 
in the NFL. Um, and that's pretty fun. Now, for me, walking around in Westchester, like, I'm going to be asked about the Jets every day, but I've never really minded it before, so it'll be fine. All right, listen, uh, appreciate your time as always, uh, and uh, get some rest after this is all said and done. <laughs> I will try. It's going to be a little bit of a busy offseason. Uh, yeah. I look forward to it. We'll be seeing you soon. The official podcast is presented by WinBet. Betting is a team sport. Bet together at WinBet. Eric Allen alongside NFL Network's Judy Batista, who's having a monster laugh here at the top of the pod. <laughs> <laughs> Who caught your eye over there? Uh, Maggie Gray and Kay Adams are over there saying hi. Okay. So I was just waving. So how many Super Bowls is this for you now? Oh, God. Um, this I think this might be like 25 or so. Um, That's yeah. really something. It is. It has changed even in that, like, that feels like a short period of time to me, and it has changed. It has gone crazy even in that period of time. What's this week like for you? Um, it's busy, but it's, um, this is, you know, this is the first normal Super Bowl we've had in three years, like, where it's back to normal access to the teams and normal Radio Row and, like, everything's in person again. Like, last year it was still sort of restricted because of the pandemic. So it's nice to sort of be back. Like, it's going to be nice to actually see the teams, not by Zoom. You know, it'll be great. What do you think about the game matchup itself? Because you're going to be covering not just the Eagles, not just the Chiefs, right, but both, both teams. <laughs> well, I mean, they're the two number one seeds, so I'm not sure you can do better than that. And obviously both I, at the quarterbacks have just been crazy great. They're, th these are such good teams and complete teams yeah. um it's hard to find a weakness uh on them I'm, I'm looking forward to i think it'll be a close game whatever it is um i you know the x factor obviously is how how is mahomes ankle but given what we saw in the afc championship game i'm not sure we should even spend a whole lot of time worrying about that you can't count him out no matter no what way. happens if I mean, since this game's close in the fourth quarter yeah. I, oh, man. I mean we saw him take off on a third down run when right. we thought he couldn't move so uh, yeah he's that, that was like a legacy-defining performance. Um, no matter what happens in this Super Bowl, that performance on one leg is – we'll be talking about that for a while. So hopefully in a few weeks we will be talking again in Arizona at the annual league meetings. Yes. We always catch up there, and that will be – And at the Combine. Uh, yes. We've got the Combine in the middle. Yes, we do. Yeah. But – the league meetings will come a couple of weeks after free agency begins. So what do you think about <laughs> where the New York Jets are at here? As Robert Sala was clear about it, that the Jets will be in a market for a veteran quarterback. You think we're going to have an answer by that time? I was going to ask you that. Um, What's going to happen over the next couple of weeks? I think that's a really good question. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of quarterback movement, which I feel like we've had the last few off seasons, like just dramatic quarterback movement. But I mean, you can see that, you know, it's no secret that the handwriting is on the wall for a few of them. I mean, Aaron Rodgers is clearly open to movement. Do you think he's playing next year? Aaron Rodgers? Yes. yes I think he'll play next year. He's, he's still playing at a high enough level that I can't imagine him walking away. Can you imagine him not playing in Green Bay? I mean, it's hard to imagine, but I think we're going to have to get comfortable with that idea because it, it seems like it's possible, mm. you know, at yeah. the very least. It seems like it's possible on both sides. Yeah. Seem to be somewhat comfortable with the idea. Right. Um, I think it'll be weird, but we've seen weird stuff before. And then, you know, I mean, obviously Derek Carr is going to be somewhere that's not Las Vegas. Jimmy Garoppolo for the second year in a row. Has, it's been said he will not be in San Francisco. I just love how they have the, exactly the same press conference. Like, Jimmy Garoppolo will not be here this year. It's like, <laughs> wait a minute. You said exactly that last year. So, you know, you've got some big quarterbacks on the move. Who the only one you don't have is Tom Brady, right? Like, he took care of that. So that's the only one that you were wondering what was going to happen. Of those guys uh, potentially leaving where they're at right now, who do you think makes the most <laughs> sense? If you're if you're the Jets right now, ah! if you're in there with the personnel meetings, you come up with an off season plan. How would you rank them? Because well, it, it's not only system fit, it's not only organization fit, but it's also a New York fit. There's just so mm -hmm. many factors involved. Well, look, I mean, the home run hit is is Rogers, right? Um, and Nathaniel Hackett's there. I mean. It, you know, I mean, he is a superstar, superstar, superstar quarterback. Um, you and I lived through the Brett Favre yes. thing. Like, <laughs> that makes me feel a little too close to that. I'm like, oh, that's too too much. Um, I, 
so I don't know if that will happen, but um, not because of the far of comparison, but just because I can't in my brain get around the idea of like reliving like it's the Packers quarterback and now he's with the Jets. Right. I actually think um, Jimmy Garoppolo makes a ton of sense. Um, you know, I mean, the only concern you have about Jimmy Garoppolo is can he stay on the field for a whole season? That's been the problem. But I, I think he makes some sense um, age-wise. And, you know, I mean, the, the question I would have with Rodgers is, you know, if he's here, for how long? Right. I mean, how much more does he want to play? Because that, that seems to be, for him at least, a year-to-year you know, thing that he has to think through. Well, which it is has understandable. been the last few years. Right, which is understandable, right? Yeah. I mean, he's obviously a guy with, uh, you know, other in- with outside interests and, like, you know, he's a curious type. So, I mean, it's understandable that every year he comes to the end of the season and wants to think about what he wants to do. But that's probably not where the New York Jets want to be year to year. Right. right. They have a good, a really good young nucleus of talent. So you'd want some sort of solidity at that position for more than a year. Um and so Garoppolo probably fits that the best. Um, we'll see. It's going to be interesting. So Judy possibly with a Garoppolo lean? Uh, <sighs> I don't know. I, I don't. I guess we have to see how. I was talking to your colleague Omar Ruiz before. Mm. He said, if you're the Jets, hey, listen, you swing for the fences. Absolutely. Of course you do. Why, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Right? I mean, of course. And you do have. Listen, I was impressed with, uh, I think we all were, some of the young players on the team. Y- you have players that if you get the quarterback in there, um, you know, you can certainly get to the playoffs and maybe, you know, rattle some cages in the AFC. Um, of course you'd take a shot at Aaron Rodgers. Like, you'd be crazy not to. Like, mm-hmm. if there's any door opened there, if it's opened even just a little bit, you have to try to kick it open. Um you know, and then if that doesn't work, you go to plan B, C, D, you know, whatever, however it is that they're ranking them in their heads. What do you like most about Garoppolo? First of all, I think he would be a good personality fit with New York. Yeah. Like, he's, be- like, think of what his career has been like. It's been weird, you know? Like, he was drafted to sort of replace Tom Brady, and then Tom Brady said, hold on a minute. Like, yeah. I am not quite done here. Um, and so, you know, he's handled all of that well. He, San Francisco, same sort of weird thing. I mean, last year, to basically be sent out to pasture and, like, literally practicing a throwing on the side during training camp, like, you know, like, don't get near the real team, and then to have to come in and play after Trey Lance gets hurt and play well, and then he gets hurt. Like, to have the personality to handle all of that, like, that's tough on a competitor. And so I actually think his personality would be be a good fit in New York, which, as we know, is not for everybody. Um, It's not easy. But I think he's got a really steady sort of personality. He does not get ruffled by all of the outside stuff, and that would be good in New York. Um, You know, and that would be something I would... You know, Aaron Rodgers is very aware of everything that is said and written, and so I wonder how that would be in New York. You know, I mean, that would be really fascinating. That would be fascinating. <laughs> um, how attractive are the Jets to these guys in the market who potentially they could be having conversations with? If you're a quarterback, if you're a signal caller, how attractive is this spot right now? We know about the history. The Jets haven't been in the playoffs since 2010, but you were talking about... But I think, th- it's, I think it's more attractive than it has been recently because you have some really young, dynamic players. I mean, right, like, players watch other players, right? So they're all aware. If you're a quarterback, you're aware of Garrett Wilson. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're... You know, you're you're aware of Sauce Gardner. Like, you're aware that they... You know, Quinn and Williams. I mean, they, they know who you've got, so... I think it's certainly more attractive than it has been in recent years. I guess I would have to think of what the other teams are that are going to be in the quarterback market that could, you know, or to, to rank, like, are they the most attractive option? I don't, you know, who knows? Well, but, it's uh, interesting because some of those teams, right, who are at the top of the draft, right? I, I, I don't think the Jets, after what's happened in the last few years, would are going to be drafting a quarterback right. early. No. Maybe no. if you're the Indianapolis Colts and you went right. the other route the last couple sure. times with the Carson right. Wentz. The Col- I'd be surprised if the Colts do not draft a right. quarterback now. Right. Yes, I agree. Uh, yeah. I do not. I, I can't, it's hard for me to imagine that the Jets draft a quarterback. 
high. Like we've just sort of been through that, and it's you know can't, can't imagine that happening. No, uh, no. whatsoever. Um, you mentioned the Jets young guys, uh, Gardner. Um, and Darrell Revis are both up for <laughs> big time honors sure. this week. Yes. Gardner's already a pro bowler. He's already an all pro. Now he could be the defensive rookie of the year voted by the Associated Press. That's going to be announced Thursday night. Revis, in his first year of eligibility for the Pro Football Hall of Fame, could Should. hear the. Should. Oh, okay. So, so talk about those guys. Talk about Gardner in year one. Talk about Revis and his legacy and how much you well, enjoyed covering him and how much you appreciated what he brought to the table. Well, if Darrell Revis isn't a first ballot Hall of Famer, then I don't, I'm not sure what a first ballot Hall of Famer looks like, right? I mean, so much, first of all, so much of being a first ballot Hall of Famer is also about who else is on the ballot because mm. it's, you know, they've got to get certain people in and they can only get a number in. But that doesn't seem to be the case this year. I thought the, the only other guy that really right. stood out to me was Joe Thomas. Joe Thomas, right? Yeah. right? So to me, that's a no brainer Like, I will be absolutely floored if he is not in. Floored. Um, he's, I mean, he, right? I mean, literally for years, like, nobody ever threw to that side of the field because of like, oh, well, I mean, he would just take people out. So he should be in. Um, and Sauce is just, I mean, gosh, is he fun. You know, and I think he's certainly has the potential to be that where he just erases people for years um, and opponents just don't even bother going in that direction. Um, and he's just like got the big personality. He's like got a huge he's personality. He's a lot of fun. <laughs> yes. He's super. Yeah. I mean, he's. He's just got a good way about he's himself. Really, yes. He has handled it really well, which I, I always admire because I, I know New York is not the easiest place. And I, I'm sure for a rookie, it is especially sort of like, you know, a smack in the face. Like, um, but and, and especially because you know, obviously, this season was not the smoothest one and was not the easiest one. And I appreciate how the young guys handled themselves. What's your most favorite memory covering Revis? Do you have one? Wow. Anything stand out? Man, I can't think of one right now. What okay. do you have? Think of. Right. I always I always tell people that he was the best practice player I've ever seen. Yeah, well, and he was very competitive at practice too. Like Well the best play I think the best players are almost always like that. Like Tom Brady, like famously in practice, would get like, you know, if they were supposed to like throw the ball into the trash can if they were playing that game and like right. he missed like he'd like stop the game and like you know, right, Peyton Man like the best players are, are like that. Like they practice the way they play. Right. Um so, yes, that's certainly true. And just ultra competitive, just crazy competitive. What about Klecko? Here, here you go. That, that I don't know. It, it's, it's been a long time, long a long time. wait for him. It seems like he's going to get the stamp. Um, yes. Uh, what do you think about what he was able to do as a player? The defensive end position, defensive tackle, nose tackle, just reinventing himself. Be able to dominate it. There's three different spots along the defensive line. And then, you know, uh, how do you think he's going to feel after hey, this, oh is, this is 30 years? I know. I can't uh, imagine how great it would feel, right, for him. Like, yeah. it would be, I mean, it would be fantastic. I love Joe Klecko, first of all, because I remember him as a player, right, and he was awesome. But also because Klecko, as a broadcaster, is, like, the most emotional Jets fan. <laughs> like, <laughs> I can remember watching, putting him on, and... Um, it was after a bad loss. I can't remember what year it was, but it was after a loss that should not have happened, like they blew a lead or something. And he was so emotional and upset and, like, you know, and w wound up about it that he was on a set and he literally was, like, having trouble staying seated. Really? Like he kept, like, he was... I'm, so I always... I love that he still cares that much, you know, that it still means that much to him. Um, I can't imagine how great it would be, right? Yeah. So uh, great. I mean... Uh, obviously, they just wanted to be in the postseason, but this is a pretty big week for the organization yes. because you got Sauce. We've been talking about him. You got Klecko. You got Reeve. Listen, yeah, like about Garrett Wilson, I, too. And right, and we haven't even <laughs> – I do feel like – look, obviously the quarterback situation went sideways, but I do feel like the arrow is pointing up on the franchise. I really feel mm -hmm. that way, and it's not just because I hope that they do well and, that, you know, and it's New York, and so I want the home teams to do well, but, like, I do feel like the – you have a good core of young players, um, 
and you obviously always need more, but like I do feel like if he can solve the quarterback situation, I know we've been saying that for however many years. It's, it's a been, big hit, but, but do you but think they are? Can, do you do you, do you think they're? We all would say, hey, they're getting a veteran, but do you think they're going to get one of these top flight veterans? we've been talking about well, look i think if we know anything about woody johnson yeah. it's like he is not afraid to to do that um and and actually he likes it right i mean he wants he likes big names and he is not afraid to have those on his team so yes i would say they are likely to come away with one of these big name veterans so there you go so then let's go back to 08 you were on the ground boots on the ground oh. hofstra university oh we view bank hall oh my god that was insane your memories of Brett Favre, and I'm not comparing it to Rodgers, but I'm saying this was a big fish. The Jets oh, went out. that was so big. Yeah, you know, interesting spot because Chad Pennington was the quarterback right. at the time, and Mike Tannenbaum, I remember, he had a news conference. Right. It wasn't even that night because the Jets were playing Cleveland in a preseason Believe game. Believe me, I know. It, okay, so, oh, yeah. so I I, I'm not And we all had to fly to Cleveland, Yeah. Uh, right? So, so the deal was done the night before, right? I believe Mike did a midnight conference call with the writers, right? So first of all, like, you're wired, like, holy cow, they just got Brett Favre. You're writing this on deadline at midnight. It, it was past midnight. Yeah. No, I think it was right? after 1 o'clock so in the morning. So we're doing this, and then you realize, oh, my God, we got to get to Cleveland the next day now. Yes. So now you're, like, frantically getting. I just remember being in Cleveland and, like, you know, on like an hour of sleep. And like, and I remember he was late, Favre was late getting to the press conference. And we were jammed into like this small room, lined up waiting for the press conference. He was, they were late getting him there. And it was just like, and it was, a, you know, it was a full on circus, right? I mean, it, this is Brett Favre. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it was crazy. And I do remember like then, you know, you're at practices and it's like. The earth was shaking. Right, dozens of reporters, like cameras everywhere. I mean, it was like a playoff week. It was nuts. And, you know, because it ended badly, people forget how it started. It started really well, eight, right? Eight and three. It started really well. And you thought, like, oh, my God, okay. And then, obviously, he got hurt and things went south. But... Um, the whole year was crazy. That whole year was crazy, but the excitement of the first half of the season when things were going well is why you sort of think like, ooh, Aaron Rodgers, right? Because you had that taste of, you know, I do. I feel like this is a general commentary, but like I feel like New York teams, not just in football, but the baseball teams for so long had not been good. Like we had that sort of fallow period in New yeah. York sports. And then when the Rangers went on the run, to the Stanley Cup Finals that year, like it sort of reminded you how great it is when a team goes on a run and how exciting it is and how everybody is paying attention. So you and are so, no, you are a neutral observer, but as a New Yorker, mm. no, you want big story, of course. Yeah. You want the big fish, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, and there's a lot of people out there. Listen, Brian Dayball used to work at the Jets. Mm -hmm. Me personally, I was happy for his success of because course. he's a good good great dude. Guy, yeah, right? great guy. I, I'd always. I'm always of the thinking that, hey, it, Giants have your success. Hopefully we have our success right. too. Right. And then the city's really something right. else when you got both teams Absolutely. jumping. Right? Absolutely. That would be the ideal situation is both teams rising at the same time because um, because there's nothing like it. Like when a team, when New York teams get into the playoffs, like, I mean, we saw it. We saw it, you know, for a week there with the Giants, like people get really energized. And I believe because it's been a while for the Jets, like Jets fans would go bananas. You know, yeah. I mean, like we saw this when they went to those two years that they went to the AFC championship game. Right. And like people get like crazy. It's so much fun. But I agree. I mean, like I like big fish, like you want the biggest stars in New York and, you know, so, Aaron Rodgers. Come on. <laughs> so super fun. <laughs> oh, oh, wait, you ever wonder what would have happened mm -hmm. to that team had Favre hurt that shoulder? Because yes. they had that post-Thanksgiving Day game against the Denver Broncos. It was raining that day. and then, Like I said, the wheels kind of fell off after that. I remember going to Seattle mm -hmm. late in the year where the Jets just had nothing. And the air came out of the building. That ultimately led to not only Favre's departure, Eric Mangini's mm -hmm. departure, and Rex Ryan comes in in 2009 right. and then... Those are the Jets' last two playoff appearances, right. 09 and 10. 
I do wonder, well, right, you can do that sort of sliding doors mm -hmm. thing all the time. Like, yeah. if, if Favre doesn't get hurt, what happens to that team? Like, right. and then is Mangini still there? Or whatever happens to Rick, we never have Rex Ryan. Like, mm -hmm. what, all of those things. I do wonder what would have happened to that team because... They were good. They were good. <laughs> they were and, good. And Brady was hurt. Yeah. So you had an opening there. Yes. Um, which is obviously the problem that you will have in the AFC East for as long as Josh Allen is, you know, is in Buffalo, right? But, like, you're right. There was an opening. Brady was hurt. You had, you know, you had the chance. Uh, I do wonder what would happen because that, that team was playing well and it was really exciting. And you could sort of see the, like, this team has, like, could cause some trouble here. Yeah. Um, I was talking to yeah, Thomas okay. Jones about those teams the other day. Mm. He had a great three-year stretch with the Jets. Yes. Very productive. And a pleasure to cover. Yeah. He was a pleasure to cover. Yeah. Uh, a good dude. Good dude. Oh, all right. So uh, let's end here before I got to put you on the, on uh -oh. the hot seat for a Super Bowl prediction. No, but um, Jets, do you think they've closed the gap inside AFC East? I mean, is the gap closing between Buffalo and not just the Jets? Miami Everybody. and yes. New England. Because you looked at the way Buffalo endured a lot this season, yeah. a lot off the field, mm -hmm. a lot on the field. The DeMar Hamlin situation, obviously, seems like he's in a lot better spot. Mm -hmm. um, but they were outclassed by Cincinnati. They were. And there were warning spots. I mean, warning signals, I think, down the line for the Bills, the way they were winning games. Jets split with them this season. New England, obviously, they need some more offensive stability, some more punch there. They get Bill O'Brien. Uh, I like what the Dolphins did, adding Vic Fangio as defensive coordinator. Yes. And they took some steps forward last year. It feels to me before we – enter the next couple months that the, the gap amongst these four teams isn't much. I would agree with that. I'll say this about the Bills. I think they ran out of gas emotionally. And, and I think you could see that at the DeMar Hamlin thing obviously took an enormous toll on them. And frankly, even watching it while it was happening, um, at, you know, when we knew he was recovering towards the end of that week um, and, and we knew he was you know, he was going to be okay. Even then, the team looked exhausted, yeah. understandably, wrung out. And they never got past that. And you sort of wondered, how are they going to get themselves back up to play, you know, playoff football against, you know, uh, the Bengals were rolling. And so I think that's what happened to the Bills. I uh, totally agree with that. They and they had big injuries, too. Yeah. Uh, Hyde was out the yes. entire year. Von Miller goes out. So I I'm not... So I expect the Bills to be okay next okay. year. Yes. You know, I yes. don't think that's a permanent condition. Listen, there are questions about every other team, right? The Dolphins, like, yes, I like what they did, but, like, you know, can Tua stay healthy? I mean, this is, and I'm not just talking about concussions. Can he stay healthy yeah. on the field? That's a big, they are a different team. We saw that. And then, you know, New England, to me, is the biggest question mark because you're like, are they going to go back to, like, having a normal offense? Like, last year was such so odd it was odd is the only word i can come up with and so i can't imagine that that condition would be allowed to continue in new england that's just not how i mean bill belichick wants to win football games so are they going to go back and can mac jones get back up to the level we saw of him as a rookie can they get him some real receivers which they i mean because they do have a solid defense they have a solid defense yeah. and bill belichick is a defensive mastermind <laughs> so the defense is never going to be terrible but like can they get him some real weapons because they still don't have that um so I have some questions about the Patriots, but I do feel like generally all of the teams are at least in the yeah, more in the mix, yeah. you know, and, and it's more competitive. It's not like the years when Brady was in New England where it would be just like a runaway and, you know, you'd be right. like halfway through the season and be like, OK, you know, this is over. I don't feel like it's that. It's that. I think the teams have closed the gap. Were you in New England sub September 23rd, 2001? Uh, I was, of course, yeah. and I was there for the Tuck Rule game and I, all of those. Like all, whenever they run the Tom Brady retrospectives, I'm like, oh, I was at that game. I'm like, oh yeah, I was at that game too. It, yes, it, it is amazing. Amazing. Looking amazing. back. Okay, uh, final thoughts on the game here. Uh, I think what I picked for NFL.com, uh, so I better be consistent, I picked the Eagles to win. Um, they feel like the more complete team, but right. you don't, just don't want Mahomes to have the ball. Oh, God, no. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's going to be close. I don't think it's a, this is a blowout. I'd be surprised if we see. Like, that. the way Tampa Bay beat the Chiefs the last time they were in the Super Bowl is such an aberration for Chiefs games. Like, they just don't get blown out. They 
every game, even if they lose, they lose by three points. So I think it'll be a close game. I agree. Like, if Mahomes says the ball last and it's close, like, eh, my pick might be bad. Um, but I do feel like the Eagles are the more complete team. Both the offensive and defensive lines are ridiculous. Incredible. Ridiculous. And they can run. They've, got the, they've obviously got the weapons. Jalen Hurts has been fantastic. Um, yeah, they feel like the more complete team to me. Enjoy your stay. Phoenix, you so you're going to be here for a long time, and then uh, <laughs> we will see you in Indy for a couple days, and then we'll be right back out here in Arizona. Which is not going to be a bad thing. I look forward to it. <laughs> Thanks, Judy. Good to see you. Jets fans, we're in our final push, and the clock is ticking. WinBet is giving you a golden opportunity to win VIP prizes for the 2023 season. The WinBet Green Room is the most exclusive space at the stadium with all-inclusive food and beverage, lower-level seats, and appearances by Jets legends and celebrities. New Jersey customers, all you need to do is wager at least $100 on WinBet's sportsbook or casino. For New York customers, all you need to do is wager at least $100 on WinBet's sportsbook. The best part? You get an entry for every $100 you wager. The official pod is presented by WinBet. Betting is a team sport. Bet together at WinBet. We do not have Jets super fan Robert Rinaldi, so we're going to have to settle for one of professional sports' best storytellers. I would argue maybe the best of all, that's Tom Rinaldi. Yeah, and, and Robert Rinaldi's brother, otherwise known in, in our house. Yeah, uh, the reference there being that my brother got season tickets to the Jets when he was 18 years old as a freshman in college and has gone to virtually every game ever since. Yeah, dedicated fan. I know. So what does Robert think of the Jets after the 2022 season? I mean, how much time do we have? Oh, my goodness gracious. I don't think you want to open that door to the GM, you know, who's sitting in his living room and, and supposedly has all the solutions. Sure. Uh, listen, I, I think when you, when you look back, we had the Jets in Lambeau. Yeah. I had the Jets sideline in right. Lambeau. What a moment. What a moment. And to think of where the season ended up from that pinnacle is tough. Yeah. But when you take a step back and you look at the overall growth, I mean, there's a lot to be excited about, obviously, when you look at the young talent on the roster. And... You know, the entire league has noticed that considering some of the awards that are going to be decided this week. What was it like for you covering that game? You've covered so many big events, so obviously this was just one in a long line of, of cool moments, sports moments. But just from a Jets perspective, it's a young team going into a historic place like Lambeau Field. You got Sauce Gardner wearing the cheese hat after the game. You got Brees Hall exploding into the end zone. Yeah. You see the Jets defense dominating a future Hall of Famer like Aaron Rodgers. As you took that all in, what were you thinking? You know, I, there's a moment that stays with me that I don't know that, that we, we necessarily captured. And that was when the quarterback at the time, when it, it became clear the Jets were going to win the game, put his hands on his helmet like in disbelief. Yeah. And I think part of that is Lambeau. Mm -hmm. Part of that is Aaron Rodgers. Part of that is... It's the Packers, and we came in here, and we beat them. And I think for the Jets, who are trying to find an identity, right, under, under Sal and everything he's trying to instill and build as a culture, you know, you looked at it at the moment as a foundational win. The question becomes, all right, what do you do with prosperity? How well do you handle it? Right. No one knew what would happen, of course, to the injury to the running back and what would happen with the quarterback position and some of the other challenges. But there, that defense is strong, and there are some real core pieces, obviously, to build around. And Joe Douglas brought in those core he pieces. Did. What are your impressions of Robert Sala and the way he connects with his team? I, I don't think there's any doubt that when Robert Sala walks into a room, right, he's a, he's a commanding presence. Physically, he's a commanding presence. Verbally, he's a commanding presence. With intensity, he's a commanding presence. He's a leader. Now, the question becomes, with an entire staff built around him, all that he concentrates and pours himself into on the defensive side of the ball, we understand, yeah. 
the other side of the ball needing to catch up to that? How quickly is he able to make that happen? That will ultimately be the ballot that's out on Coach Sala. What do you think about the Jets here? We're taping this Super Bowl week. Thursday, NFL honors. Sauce Gardner up for yeah. Defensive Rookie of the Year. Garrett Wilson up for Offensive Rookie of the Year. And then potentially you could get two Hall of Famers in in Joe Klecko, who's had a 30-year wait. And Darrell Revis could be going in first-year eligibility. So this is an incredible week for the Jets. Yeah. I mean, in so many ways. It just, so I'll, I'll just, let's just pick Sauce for a second. Uh, I mean, uh, there was a lot of excitement about Sauce. Um, obviously, given his draft position, given how beautifully he played in college. But I don't know that anybody saw that Sauce would become this good, this fast, and become really the identity mm. of the defense right? in that position, which is a hard thing to do. If you want to talk about the identity of the glory days of the Jets' defense, you go to Klecko. And you think, wow, after all this weight, what would it mean to him? And what would it mean to Jets' fandom to see Klecko get in? And when it comes to Revis, I mean, I don't think there's any doubt. I think he's a first ballot Hall of Famer, and I think he'll be in. Sauce creating his own island right now. He for is. The Jets, no, isn't he? Right, no <laughs> question about it. And, I, and the value of that, all that that does to permeate the other levels of the defense, when you know you have, you go back to Revis, when you know you can shut down the aerial portion of one part of the field, mm -hmm. all that that allows the coaching staff defensively in their game plan to do in terms of play style, aggression, all of that, which can emanate from having that lockdown presence on the back end. Special player. Robert Sala said after the season, the Jets committed to adding a veteran quarterback. As we sit here right now, what do you think makes sense for the team as they move ahead? I think that's such a good question. Obviously, everybody has seen the hack at hire and, and wants to interpret that to mean that Aaron Rodgers will come over. The franchise has been down that path with Favre in the past. Obviously, that didn't yield the success that the Jets fandom had hoped. Who knows what will happen with Aaron Rodgers? But this much we do know. You can't succeed in the NFL without that position being right. right. And when you look at it, it's just a great reminder of how mysterious success is in the position when you don't build it situationally. Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant, what he did this year, again, prior to, to the unfortunate elbow injury and the conference title, you know, at some point, it was almost like people were waiting, right, for him to turn back into the pumpkin. Right. And at some point, you have to acknowledge, maybe he's just a really good player in a great situation. Can the Jets find that? Yeah. A good player in a great situation. They have the defensive part of that great situation equation, it looks like being built, developing, coming into its own. It's the offensive side now. Do you think some of these <clears throat> veteran quarterbacks will look at this team and say, this is a very good situation? No question because of that defense. Yeah. I mean, how many quarterbacks who are later in their career want to be able to say, boy, you know what? I know I'm going to be good if, if I can build a lead. Right. I know that's a defense that's going to create turnovers and get me the ball. I know if there's a situation where we've turned it over, they can be stout and minimize the damage. That's, that has great appeal to a quarterback. I think as much appeal as playmakers on the edges and specialists. And I know people love to say, well, Aaron, you know, Aaron Rodgers, boy, how much he misses Devontae. Sure he does. But would he miss having a top five defense? Which would he miss more? Yeah. Something to think about. And the Jets on the offensive side of the ball, it's not like they're void of talent. It you, know, you got Garrett Wilson. You got Brees Hall. We mentioned him before. You have Elijah Barrett Tucker is one of the versatile, most versatile offensive linemen in the National Football League. You have foundational pieces there. And listen, you, you know, sometimes when a player gets injured, you know, we forget the impact and how much it continues through the season. And when Brees got hurt, I mean, you, you, you can look. It changed everything mm -hmm. about how the Jets functioned offensively. 
and you know we go back to that game in Lambeau, which was sort of his coming out party, right, Eric? I mean, he he played so well in that game, and to think that he couldn't stay healthy then through the balance of the season, I'm sure. <clears throat> pardon me, nobody more disappointed than Hall himself, but the the spillover effect of that injury can't be overstated for the offense in the Jets. All right, so what kind of advice would you give young storytellers out there as far as they want to get into the business and they want to be able to capture the moment because you have done that at such a high level throughout your career and now you're approaching your first Super Bowl. So I think it took me a long time to to come to what I would consider to be in telling a story these three qualities that I hope I can live up to, but I'm conscious of them at least as guiding principles for me. It took me too long to find them. Number one, above all, is accuracy. I could tell the most moving story about you, but if your sister's name is Susan and I got that name wrong, that's the first thing you're going to say to me. So accuracy. The second thing is empathy. To, to understand that as much as we might hold players and coaches on pedestals, that at the end of the day, it's the common bond of shared humanity that cuts through and makes the stories resonate with a viewer, with a listener. So it's empathy. And the third is genuine and earnest curiosity. Yeah. If I am doing an interview with you, you're wonderful at this right now. You look at me as I'm answering the question, your questions come very naturally. If I have a pad and you're beginning your answer and I'm more concerned with knowing what my next question is than your answer to the question I've just posed, what does that say to the subject? Yeah. So yeah. I think those yeah, three... are not there with you. Right. Yeah. Those three things, I think, help me. I don't always live up to them, but I try to. Uh, listen, um, what... Is it going to be like for you on Sunday? You've done so many things, the mountaintop of professional sports, but this is your first Super Bowl. It is. I mean, it's amazing to think that we're going to have the opportunity to do the sidelines of the Super Bowl. I mean, it's I never would have thought it would have been possible. Just even a couple of years ago, I never would have thought it would have been possible. And you're right. I mean, I, how blessed am I to have been able to do Wimbledon, to be able to do the Masters, yeah. to, to be able to do the Rose Bowl, to be able to do you know the semi and the, and the title game in college football, uh, to be able to do playoff games, you know a four overtime playoff game in the NBA as a sideline report. I mean all of those things. But at the end of the day, in America, one event is pinnacle. Yeah. Not in sport, in events, and it's the Super Bowl. And so to be a part of that, especially on this team, which makes it feel special, Greg and Kevin, who are incredible stories themselves and, and foster a great fellowship among our crew, Aaron, who's just terrific and been doing it for such a long time at a high level, it's just an amazing, amazing opportunity. Well, you belong on that stage, and let's end here. Uh, you talk about empathy. You got empathy for your brother and Jets fans, and also from a storytelling angle, do you root? for the Jets to turn this around because it has been 12 years since they have made the postseason because that fan base is very unique and their hunger is, I think, unmatched right now, them wanting that winner again. Listen, <clears throat> fandom aside, selfishly, so we're NFC-based, yeah. but in the New Deal, I think we'll do more games that have crossover and that have AFC-NFC matchups and perhaps AFC-AFC matchups. The league is better when the Jets are better. It's the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut market. It's the most densely populated part in our country, A. B, it's got a colorful history it will forever have the wagging of the number one running off the field the mink coat of broadway joe you know just an enduring icon that helped build the nfl oh, yeah. into what it is now that's a jet story that helped create the monolith that is the shield a jet story helped do that so when the jets are good and can tap into that that's a tide that lifts all boats including the dinghy named Robert Rinaldi. <laughs>
back <laughs> in Creskill, New Jersey. Coming full circle. Have fun on Sunday. Uh, we're so happy for you. Congratulations on everything you've achieved. But I really mean this, that you deserve to be on that stage. And then the more we see of you in the future, it's going to be a good thing for us because, you know, the Jets are going to be back in prime time again. J-E-T-S.